Bismillah, walhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum, AD. How you doing, buddy? It's good to see you. Yeah. Um, this is a chilly morning. You guys hungry? Yeah? Hey, you doing patches? There's Halo. She got that ring around her. There you go, buddy. Kibble. Get your day started right. Or you can chase goats. ID's going after trouble this morning. You can see he's got her by the collar which is <laughs> not as bad as it could be. Good boy. Good boy. Yeah. Good boy. Well, one of the things we're trying to do is get AD to eat his food as quickly as it's served. Uh, we mentioned before that while he protects these goats, he doesn't necessarily see himself as the uh, as the alpha of the herd, and so he won't defend his food against the alpha, which is trouble over here. Uh, even though you saw AD harassing trouble, as far as the hierarchy of things goes, he understands that he's subordinate to her. As such, he'll let her take his food without defending it, which obligates me to stay out here and monitor him while he's eating. Well, that's okay, except that he uh, will dilly and he'll dally and it'll take more time than frankly I'm willing to put in. And so he needs to understand the urgency of taking his meal when it's served. Certainly these goats do, they're very food driven, but dogs like to play and they're impulsive and they're distractible and they appreciate affection almost as much as they appreciate food. So. I sometimes have to get stern with this guy and make sure that he eats when it's served. And if he continues to dilly dally, I'll just pick it up and leave. Y'all done with your food? Good boy. Good boy. All right. Guess we're all set here. Let me check on your water. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Well, we got a little job to do today. Um, some illumination of the driveways and walkways of the property. Aisha picked up some, uh, some solar powered um, lighting that we are going to uh, put up. I picked a couple of spots on the property where I thought they would be most helpful. And uh, I guess the first thing we're gonna do is remove these mounts. <clears throat> and get the hardware. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, mount this up here. I think one of the challenges, or, oh look at those little mushrooms. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. Anyway, 
I think one of the challenges is that we've got some uh, some wet wood here and not very not very long screws um, we might be able to do something kind of temporary perhaps and then come back with uh, with better hardware but uh, there's a spot up here uh, it looks like I can get a proper bite one of the um, one of the things that it was true for us, and I suspect probably true for others, but uh, nobody really talks about is how scary uh, having all this acreage can be when you're not used to it. And we first got here, you know, suburban suburban living is uh, was our norm. Manicured, uh, planned housing and. Uh, almost exclusively human neighbors and uh, certain level of um, comfort in that or at least uh, familiarity and then uh, all of a sudden you get out here and you hear these you hear these strange noises and um, you realize there's so much happening on the property uh, that you don't know about and uh, all of those strange sounds um, yeah they start to become kind of worrisome and there's this idea that seeing is believing and um, so one of the uh, things to consider then in the absence of light which of course is necessary for sight, the only thing you have are your beliefs. And I can only speak for myself, but um, the beliefs that I have in the absence of light, kind of frightening. It's pretty, pretty incredible how a bit of light um, can restore one's wits and I don't know, you know, just as a kind of uh, general commentary on uh, faith or presence of mind or whatever we want to call it, is that some sort of um, existential failing that light is so necessary for our security? I'm just going to set this ladder down here while I close this gate. This is the uh, bridge onto our property. You can see that the uh, the creek runs right through the front here. Certainly within a lot of spiritual traditions there's the metaphor of light and it seems to me that uh, Ideally, that light would be internalized to the point where one's security wasn't quite so dependent on uh, sensory input. But I'm not there yet, and I very much within my animal self, and I recognize that. Um, of my vulnerabilities by definition put me at risk for harm and uh, so I need to know what's happening around me my physical self demands that security so thank God for the blessing of our eyes and the opportunity to meet the sensory requirements of those eyes through the miracle of good lighting. I'm going to set up this ladder. Yeah, man. So light is important. 
and I wonder how some of you folks deal with um, the phantasms that threaten you in the dark. Uh, darkness is such a contextual thing. There are some times where it is absolutely the best thing in the world. I don't know if you guys have ever had a, an experience with a float tank. Uh, sometimes they call them a sensory deprivation tank. Just really such a such a cool thing. Uh, had a chance to do that. Uh, I was. It's probably been a year or a couple of years maybe. Um, and uh, basically, the idea is that you go into a uh, um, a pod, or it could just be a really, really, really dark room. Well, I guess it doesn't even start. Oh God, that's scary. There we go. Here I am, afraid of the dark. I should just be more mindful of uh, ladder safety. That wrong way. Anyway, you get into these, um, uh, it could be a pod, it could be a, um, uh, a pitch black room. And in either case, there's a tub that you step into. And that tub is filmed, is uh, filled with um, body temperature water. So, you know, 98.6 degrees or whatever, that's Fahrenheit. Not sure what the Celsius conversion is. Um, 37 maybe, 36 and some change. Anyway, the, um, the water is the same temperature as your body. And it's filled with uh, Epsom salt, uh, hundreds and hundreds of pounds of Epsom salts. And the effect of the Epsom salt is that the water uh, keeps you floating. And uh, you're provided with the earplugs. Goodness gracious, this is scary. Hold on a second. Ah, there we go. I think, I think that'll be a bit more secure. Okay, maybe, maybe. Good news is I'm not actually that high off the ground. I'm on a slope here and I would just fall onto the hillside. But anyway, the ladder actually is here just to keep me from stepping in the mud. Back to the Epsom salts. The um, Epsom salts keep you floating and you're in the dark and you get earplugs. And uh, the pod or the room where the tub is located, whatever the setup is, um, is uh, diminishes any sound. So now you're in darkness, you're in silence, you're in room temperature, I'm sorry, body temperature water floating. And uh, under the best circumstances, get this sort of uncanny, uh, physical dissociation. They just feel absolutely disconnected from, uh, there we go, from your own body. There we go. And uh, in this sort of, um, I don't know, this non-corporeal state, I have no idea what that looks like on the camera there. Sorry if I bumped you guys. Um, it's uh, super interesting what the experience is like. Now I've heard about people having panic attacks and such, uh, but for me, it was pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, and I highly recommend it. And that was an instance where darkness was anything but frightening. I think certainly, intentionality. I'm all twisted in knots here. Erg. Okay, I think I think that'll work. Intentionality has a lot to do with it. Um, but yeah, let me know if you've ever been on a float tank. I'm gonna come up this way. Uh, Ethan is doing some leveling with the dirt that we dug out of the trench yesterday. All right, and this is our last one. 
uh, for now. Um, actually, maybe it's not. Our, maybe it's our second to last one. This is the uh, pathway up to the goat pen, which can be, again, pretty frightening. Uh, coming out here at night, one of the only reasons we do is generally to see why it is that AD is barking so much. And uh, as a livestock guardian, he really doesn't bark for no good reason. Um, you guys have come on walks with us and he's a pretty quiet dog. Ah. Ah, that one doesn't want to go. I apologize that those leaves are right in the way here. I'll move him. There we go. So he's, he's pretty quiet. So when he starts barking, it's always a little nerve wracking. Um, and then usually falls on me to come out here and check, see what's going on. Now, thankfully, uh, oh no. Well, I mean, yes, thankfully, nothing terrible has ever happened. Uh, however, there was one time where I came all the way out here. I bring a headlamp or something else, um, but I came all the way out here and didn't see anything. And hung out by the goat pen and just kind of looked around and, um, and everything was cool. But uh, on my way back, to the house wouldn't you know it man it's right out of a right out of a cartoon um, I'm heading back and uh, I get that eye shine my headlights my headlamp rather hits the eyes of an animal and that animal is staring back at me and uh, I didn't want to go any further so I ended up enlisting AD's help I brought him out and uh, two of us walked back to the house together. But now I had a dilemma because I had to walk back to the pen. Here, this is a reenactment. I had to walk back to the pen with AD now that we had cleared out whatever rogue varmints were wandering the property in the dark and I had to bring AD back, and I still had the dilemma of getting back to the house on my own, in the dark, with nothing but my headlamp. Um, thankfully, that went okay, and I lived to tell the tale. There is talk about picking up a shotgun uh, for such forays at night. I mean, we probably will do that, but one thing at a time.